Welcome to this week's edition of the Fermented Friday Virtual Beer Tasting. I'm joined today by BAM's president and general manager of Milk House Brewery at Still Point Farm, Sarah Healy. Uh, I will introduce Sarah right now. Sarah, how are you doing? Hey, Jim. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Thank you for joining me. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Sure thing. Uh, so... Oh, you're already drinking. Lucky you. I caught grief from the rest of the BAM team because I told them that I don't drink during these things. I had one of them call me an amateur and the other one just laughed at me. So. What? <laughs> you should have a beer. It's Friday after all. And yeah, I was just going to say, it's 3 o'clock on Friday. It's time for people to uh, pull out some great Maryland beer and uh, get ready to sample a little bit. Definitely. So I'll just do a quick rundown about what we're doing this afternoon. If you've been tuning in over the last few weeks, we have a couple of... Uh, preceding videos like this we're getting together with breweries around the state to talk about how they are uh, managing business right now during this crazy uh, unprecedented time and i thought it would be a great idea to chat with you you and i are pretty friendly together and it's great that you are the president of our association so you can give us some insight about what's going on kind of from your perspective with uh, the membership here and then maybe yeah. share with us what's going on at milk house for those of you who have not been to Milk House Brewery at Still Point Farm, it is located in Mount Airy. It's a beautiful property, great views, wonderful farm brewed beer, uh, Maryland's first farm brewery to open to the public, and uh, we're really proud to have them as a member. Before we jump into this, I do want to say if you are able to support Maryland beer in any way, we would greatly appreciate you reaching out to Maryland breweries and uh, showing your support by either picking up beer at curbside pickup locations or using beer delivery options that are available. Um, Maryland Beer relies on you. Your neighbors run these small businesses. These small businesses, it, these small businesses employ your neighbors. So please, please show your support if you are able to. Uh, so with that, I'm going to ask Sarah to kind of introduce what she does at Milk House and uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on there. So Sarah, take it away. Awesome. So yeah, as Jen mentioned, um, I'm the GM at the brewery. Um, there's two of us full-time, myself and our brewer, um, Harry, and he brews the beer and I pretty much do everything else. So um, tasting room management, um, we have four tap tenders um, who are all amazing, very knowledgeable, um, and they miss seeing you and all of our regulars right now, since we are closed to the public. Um, so yeah, I manage the tasting room. I schedule events, bands, um, social media, ordering, kind of a little bit of everything. Um, so yeah, that's what I do there. Um, as far as right now, we have been closed. Um, we did two weekends of curbside um, when COVID kind of really hit Maryland um, and we made the decision to close um, during the state of the emergency um, just out of an abundance of caution for our staff, um, the owners and the public. Um, as Jim mentioned, we are a farm brewery and the owners actually live on the property. So there's one driveway. If you go to the left, you'll go to their house. If you go to the right, you'll go to the brewery. Um, so we're just trying to do our part um, and keep people safe. Um, but in the meantime, uh, you know, just kind of trying to wade through this and see, um, see what's going to come out on the other end. So, yeah. I'd like to apologize, uh, quickly. When I did your introduction, your microphone was muted, so they didn't hear me <laughs> say hello back. But, uh, I also <laughs> wanted to let people know that I am aware that the governor is speaking right now also. So if you're splitting time, uh, that's cool. Also, if you have any questions for Sarah or for me about the state of Maryland beer, please throw them in the comments. We'd be happy to uh, answer those and address them. So, Sarah, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what you understand of why Tom and Carol Ann decided to open Milk House Brewery at Still Point Farm and kind of what their philosophy was going into farm brewing and why that was important to them. Yeah, for sure. So um, Tom and Carol Ann purchased uh, their farm about 12 years ago. Um, so it's a 47 acre plot of land. Um, primarily hay was the only crop there 
um, no corn or soy, anything like that. Um, Tom's been an avid home brewer since his 18th birthday. Um, his dad actually purchased him a homebrew kit for his 18th birthday back before uh, home brewing was legal. <laughs> so he has been very passionate about beer his entire life um, throughout college, um, even going to law school. He always homebrewed something that he loved. And so when he and Caroline bought the farm, he immediately wanted to plant hops. That was the first additional crop that was ever planted on the farm other than hay. Um, so the first hops were Cascade and Chinook and a one acre hop yard. Um, Carol Ann has always been very passionate about animal husbandry. Um, so what a lot of people don't know about the farm is that we actually raise a rare heritage breed of sheep called Lester Longwools. Um, they're originally brought here by our founding fathers um, and they are still considered critical with livestock conservancy. Um, we have one of the largest flocks in the US. We have, well, I guess now that we just had lambs, we have about 65 <laughs> total. Um, they are a dual purpose breed for fiber and meat. Um, we primarily use them for their fiber. And we also use them as integrative pest management in our hop yard. So um, sheep have cold manure, which means that you can use it immediately, unlike um, cow or horse where you have to actually compost it. Um, so once the hops are strung, we kind of put them in there. They defoliate the bottom, but leave the binds intact. Um, and that just helps us kind of combat mold and mildew issues common here in the mid-Atlantic with our wet climate. Um, so anyways, Tom planted hops and then he was like, well, if wineries can grow grapes and have a winery, then can I grow hops and have a brewery? And he went to the county and they were like, no, we don't know. And he went to the state and they were like, no, we don't know. So he got together with a couple of other farmers in the area um, and helped to draft the farm brewery legislation, uh, which passed in 2012. Um, so basically, um, the, the whole idea was being able to have a for-profit product on the farm that could help support a family farm um, without having to move to major cropping such as corn, soy, um, or sell to like a Monsanto type um, to keep the land. So yeah, opened the brewery um, in 2013 and been growing hops and raising sheep and brewing beer ever since. We talk a lot uh in the company that I work for, Grow and Fortify, uh, we are hired on as the management teams for the Brewers Association of Maryland, the Maryland Wineries Association, and the Maryland Distillers Guild. Um, we talk a lot about value-added agriculture. It's a, it's a point of our business to work and cultivate an environment where value-added agriculture is something that happens throughout the state and that consumers are aware of it. And there is really no better representation of adding value to agriculture than visiting a farm brewery where ingredients that are grown on the farm are used in beer, uh, thus making them profitable for the farmer, the same way that you would if you went to a vineyard and enjoyed a wine made on a, uh, a vineyard estate winery or something like that. Um, I also really think that that's cool how you mentioned that sheep are very symbiotic uh, in terms with what's going on with the hop yard. If the sheep are helping to keep the bottom of the vines cleaned up, they're nourishing and they're also helping um, kind of maintain things in that yeah. in that agricultural process. That's really cool. Absolutely. I know yeah, they're very cool. And unlike goats who, you know, if you put them in there, they would just rip it all down and eat the vines themselves. They actually, they just defoliate and eat everything around it. And they, they love that. So it's good for them. It's good for us. And, you know, we try to maintain as um, organic of um, maintenance as we possibly can. Sometimes, unfortunately, with the climate, we do have to um, have some chemical intervention, but that's absolutely a last ditch resort for us. So they are, they're pretty cool. I've come to love them more the longer that I've <laughs> been around the farm. And this time of year is also uh, pretty busy for you guys. You mentioned that you have the lambs, but this, I, I always recall this season being tight on Tom's time because lambing was such an important part of what was happening there on the farm. Yes. Yeah. So we um, finished up lambing, I guess, about two weekends ago. So we have um, 15 little ones, um, all happy and healthy. We only have one bottle baby this year. His name is Center. You probably see him um, make some appearances on our social media. Um, so yeah, we actually had a very, um, very successful year. 
um, new ram this year that we purchased last year at the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival. And um, we've been really pleased with that. So hopefully everybody keeps growing. They're at the point now that they're really fun where they race around and um, play king of the hay bale and are really, they're really cool now kind of coming into their personalities. So that they've, they've definitely been a joy to watch even in this kind of bummer of a time. So uh, other than lambs and hops, uh, what else, what else is going on at the farm? I know you said it's kind of quiet with, uh, with the kind of your response as a business to what's happening with COVID, but uh, is Harry still brewing? Is are there still processes happening at the brewery right now? As of right now, no. Um, all but I think one of our tanks was already full. Um, fortunately for us, two of those were loggers. So it actually worked out really well for us as far as timing, um, just for letting those condition. Um, hopefully, um, as everybody knows that's watching since Governor Hogan is speaking right now, um, in regards to the, the reopening plan for the state. Hopefully very soon we will have some information for everybody after we you know get to sit down and talk it through. Um, we do have some things, obviously we could do beer to be kegged up, um, but yeah, things are quiet at the brewery. Um, as far as the farm, um, got the hop yard crowned, we've got um, all our cables and poles tightened up in the hop yard, so that's been really nice. We've cleaned a lot of fence line that probably hasn't been cleaned in a very long time. Um, so yeah, we're just trying to do the best that we can to kind of get ready for the season. Um, as I said, a, a good portion of, of the property is hay. So making sure all of our hay making equipment is ready to go. Um, that's kind of been happening and there's always work to be done on the farm. So I, I do think it's been a nice, um, I don't want to say it's a vacation because it's obviously very stressful time, but I do think it's it's been nice for Tom to be able to focus a little more um, on things around the farm than also stressing about the brewery being open. Well, and it sounds like it's a pretty easy shift to have your brewery staff turn into farmhands. <laughs> yeah, I guess we do have um, a little bit of dual purpose. I didn't I didn't know that I was going to be. Uh, helping to birth baby lambs when I started. But um, yeah, if you would have told me that a few years ago, I probably would have laughed, but it's it's cool. I wouldn't trade it. All right. So I think most of the people tuning in are mostly interested in the liquid libations that are made there at Milk House. And I yeah. know you have a cooler next to you with some goodies in there to share. Um, why don't you go ahead and start talking about the beer that Milk House is known for making? Cool. So um, we're going to taste through five beers today. Um, I do apologize to everybody that you were not able to get these and taste along with us, but very soon, hopefully. Um, so the first beer that I have is our local lager. So this is our beer flavored beer. It's 3.9%. Uh, it's about nine IBUs. It's light lager, 100% Maryland grown ingredients. This is, um, as you can see, clear, frothy, delicious. Um, this is my go-to, um, especially in the warmer weather around the farm, because um, you can have a couple and still continue to get work done. Um, we definitely found that this was something kind of missing in our uh, portfolio, because um, we'd never done a lager before, but we're kind of known for making very traditional, true to style beer, so, um, a lager, a light lager kind of just seemed like a natural fit for us. So yeah, very crisp, refreshing, very light floral note. Sometimes we tell people this is like 100% Marilyn Miller light, if you will, because you know, you always get those people who come to your brewery and are looking for, you know, I drink Miller, Bud or Coors. Um, you know, that's all right. We've got, we've got a little bit of something for everybody. So, and it's definitely just become one of our favorites. So cheers. Todd Anderson in the comments says uh, he's very happy to see you there. And oh, hey, Todd. He is demanding stairway. So, Todd, just hang tight a few more minutes. Stairway's <laughs> coming up. I promise you it's in the lineup today. It is indeed. That's funny. Hey, it's Todd, great to see fans of your brewery pop into the comments and uh, heckle or <laughs> applaud. Yeah, absolutely. 
So yeah, local so, water. Uh, uh, no, go ahead. You, you were saying that you kind of brewed this as an approachable beer for people to have when they come in. Uh, it fits in line with the tradition of American beer drinking style, the light lager. Uh, surprisingly, it's not the first American light lager we've seen on uh, these tastings, which is, I, I truly appreciate because years ago, it seemed as though there wasn't an approachable beer at every brewery for the, the mass consumer. And uh, it's nice to see that kind of all breweries are under the impression of, I need to have an offering for each person that walks through the door. Absolutely. Um, so that, that shift is kind of cool to see. How is the response for this beer at the, at the brewery when you guys are open? Is it something that people really enjoy seeing? Yeah, people have really enjoyed it. So as you know, cause you've, you've been a friend of the brewery for, you know, since the beginning, um, our first so I have a dog playing with the toy. Um, the Our former light approachable beer was the Dolly Hyde Farmhouse Ale, um, which we still make. Obviously, it's our flagship since we're on Dolly Hyde Road. Um, but, and, you know, we would have people like the Miller Light drinkers would drink it because it's light, approachable, et cetera. But certainly the Belgian is going to have a lot more yeast character probably than... Um, than those people may be looking for. And we've actually seen um, a good bit of cannibalization of the Dolly Hyde since um, introducing local lager. Um, we definitely still have the Dolly Hyde fans, but local lager has really taken the cake, especially, like I said, in the, those really hot months, just something super light and crisp. Um, but we, we definitely, I mean, we have 16 draft lines and a beer engine, so we, certainly have a wide variety and something for everyone but i don't know i i think i'm like always known as being the person who asks for beer flavored beer when i go places so <laughs> i really enjoy the i really enjoy the lagers i want to give a quick shout out to brendan o'leary of true respite he just popped in he's very happy to see you sarah he said sarah is my heroine so keep oh. it up. <laughs> hey your, brendan thanks your members appreciate all the hard work that you're doing Oh, thank you. You are really the hero of Maryland beer right now for, for putting beer me together with your friends and offering it to not only those of us in the state, but around the country. And that's huge. So thank you so much for everything that you guys have done for Maryland beer. That's been, there's a lot of, a lot of breweries would not be making it right now without you guys. So thank you. And that's a great plug. If you're looking for great Maryland beer to be delivered to your front door or picked up from the curbside near you, check out beerme.com, B-I-E-R-M-I.com, and uh, show your love for Maryland beer. I just did it yesterday. I got some old mother beer delivered, and that was the coolest thing that has happened. Delivery beer and to-go cocktails. Who knew? What a time I, to be alive. <laughs> I've had uh, two deliveries now of True Respite beer. I've had some Idiom beer delivered, and uh, old mother just started doing the delivery when I went in and picked up from them, so... It's working nice. out well, uh, and I, I couldn't be happier as a consumer. Absolutely. And he would like us to stop now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so what's the next beer that you're going to share with everybody? All right. Let me move this over. I had to bring proper glassware from the brewery because um, usually at my house I drink out of mason jars. I didn't think that uh, <laughs> the Facebook public would appreciate that. <laughs> so the next beer that I have is uh, Green Farmer. So this is actually Green Farmer number 14. Um, we just put these kegs in um, right as we were closing. So some people have had this um, if they did the last weekend of pickup, but otherwise it's basically new. So the Green Farmer is a rotating pale ale series. Um, it's always 100% local. And it started with our partnership with the University of Maryland um, and getting hops from their experimental hop yard with Brian Butler. Um, so originally the first iteration was called Test Yard that we did with them. And then um, we didn't actually have a pale ale in our portfolio. Long time ago, we had a smash. Um, and there was something about it that we just didn't love. So we kind of removed pale ale from our repertoire um, and then brought it back with Green Farmer. So like I said, this is the 14th one, 100% Maryland grain. So it does have some Vienna malt um, from Dark Cloud. And this one is primarily nugget. 
um, and it has just a little bit of Cascade dry hop. So uh, that's going to sound really redundant in all of the beer tasting that we're going to do today because we only use hops from Maryland. Um, so they are primarily Cascade, Chinook, Southern Cross, Brewer's Gold, um, Catoctin Heritage, which we'll talk about a little bit later um, in the native barrel. Um, yeah, so we don't we don't buy any sexy West Coast juicy hops. Um, we only buy what we can grow here. So it does, sorry if all the recipes sound the same, but that that's what we use. <laughs> so anyways, this is a beautiful, a little bit of a golden color to it from that Vienna. Um, it's just crisp and refreshing, very dry. It's only 5%, so can crush it all day. So I'm going to, cheers. And while Sarah sips that, I'll just clarify, for those of you watching who don't know what smash means when you're talking about a beer, that is a single malt and single hopped recipe where yes. you are showcasing one specific uh, malt and hop combination to kind of show how those two ingredients would play back and forth. Exactly. I had someone years ago, I was out in an account and they were like, you can't call your beer smash. There's this other brewery that has a beer called smash. And I was like, that's a beer style. It's not a beer name. They were like, no, it's not. I was like, mm, yeah, it is. <laughs> if you just want to go ahead and Google, that is a beer style. But yeah, we, we've we gone back and forth about single malt, uh, single hop. Actually, the iteration before this was, um, I believe it was a smash. It was all brewer's gold. We use, you know, just the old school delicious. I mean, it was, it was fabulous. We, every, everyone is a little bit different and I like different things about each one of them. We first started like, oh, we'll just keep doing this until we find one recipe that we love, but we've just found it such a cool way to showcase local ingredients, what we have available from our local partners, um, and just show that you can make really great beer with local ingredients. Like it's cool to use local stuff, but who cares if the beer isn't good, right? You need it to be, need it to be good. So it's been a really fun project over the last four years, I guess we've been doing this. One of the things that used to be the mantra at the brewery where I worked was local for the sake of local is not good for anybody. Oh, but when you're producing something that's showcasing what you're doing locally and it's true to the message of what your community is about, then local really means something. So I, I think that that's, that's true across Maryland's breweries. I don't see much of the gimmick of local for lo the sake of being local. I really do think that uh, Maryland's breweries are very proud of where they are and proud of the relationships that they've fostered in their communities to be able to provide beers that feature local ingredients, whether that be, uh, you know, malt and hops or fruit additions or uh, yeah. any extract that they may be looking for to add to the beer. We look at breweries that are doing uh, collaborations with candy manufacturers in Baltimore, um, you know, just really unique things to make local mean something more than just, Absolutely. hey, it has some Absolutely. stuff that was from here. Yeah, and we, we feel so fortunate that we've, sorry, my dog is playing with his uh, BarkBox Koala right now. He's very excited about it. Um, we've been so fortunate over the years to build such wonderful relationships with our local partners. Um, and it, it means so much, especially being a true working farm and understanding how difficult it can be to farm for money. There's a difference between farming with money and farming for money. And um, just for us to be able to keep that money locally within our community and support those small families, you know, we, we know them, we know their spouses, we know their children, um, you know, they come and spend time with us at the farm, we go spend time with them at their farms. Um, and it just really speaks to the culture that we've be able, been able to create at Milk House as being, um, yeah, it's great that we're a brewery, but it feels like we're a little bit more of a community center in that aspect. So it's just, and, it, and it's twofold. You know, one, that's, that's really great. But two, for us to be able to educate our customers that beer is an agricultural product. Beer comes from the earth. It doesn't just come out of a tap. So it's, it's been a, a great experience to be able to connect people with, um, with that. You know, we have kind of this idea now that we care about where our food comes from and we understand that food comes from farms. Um, and to see people really starting to make that connection that 
beer also comes from farms um, is very cool. And, and people show a ton of interest in that. So it's, it's, um, it's a very special thing to be able to do. I think the Maryland beer consumer is very fortunate that there are so many examples now of farm breweries throughout the state as well. We're not talking about uh, this experience being solely unique to one place out here in Frederick County. Or, uh, we're talking about, you know, almost every county in the state that is represented by breweries has a brewery located on a farm or a property that was designated yeah. as agriculture and is maintaining that uh, yeah. designation. And I think that that is truly a way to bring bring ownership of Maryland back to the consumer because they're able to truly partake in what is a Maryland product. Absolutely. Um, and, and I find that to be a very, uh, it's kind of a romantic thing when you think about it, to be able to come back and say, hey, I'm drinking something that came from the ground here. You know, that's that's really cool. Yeah, it's it's really cool. And like you were saying, even with the, the different fruits and stuff, like the relationships we've been able to build with fruit growers, um, you know, up Bobby Black up at Catoctin Orchard, um, our friends at Distillery Lane Cider Works, you know, it's really cool. And it's, it's also cool um, just how broad agriculture is. You know, you think of a lot of like, oh, you have a farm, like you, you just crop corn and soy, or you just have beef cows, or you just, you know, there's so many different ways that um, a brewery like us and so many other breweries in the state are able to support local ag. Um, and it's amazing to see how many, sorry, <laughs> it's amazing to see um, how many people are doing that. Um, it's awesome. It, like, I just saw that, uh, was it True Respite that just got a delivery of brews? Sorry. Uh, local grain and hops and getting some yeast from Jasper. Like, that's awesome. I love seeing people do that because we're all doing it different. You know, it's, it's really cool. So as the president of the organization, are you excited with the proliferation of more good, honest farm breweries? Like the, the, the reality that people get to go to the place where their beer is grown and brewed. I mean, is, does that excite you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it is such a cool thing seeing people. It's like, you see the light bulb, like the aha moment of like, Oh, this is, this is really, this makes sense to me, you know, because you can talk about it. You can show people pictures of it, but to really get them down on a farm. Um, and now we're seeing so many farm breweries that are doing festivals as well, which is so cool. And it, it brings people more to the farm part than the brewery part. Um, I think it's amazing. And I think the, the breadth of different experiences that you can have at a Maryland brewery is, is just wild. Like I think about when I moved here, not even really a craft beer drinker eight years ago. And, you know, I remember like, oh, it was so cool to go to Flying Dog and, um, which is still cool to go to. But I just think of like how few options there were of places to go then. And now it's like under normal circumstances that the world isn't on fire. I mean, you could go to a different brewery every day of the weekend and it would take you months to go to all of them. So I think it's just incredible to see so many people having the opportunity to create a product that they love, whether it's in a farm setting or any other brewery setting. It's, it's really it's truly amazing to be able to meet and hang out and spend time with people who do that. We have a, a wonderful collection of people in our state and I'm very proud and honored to represent all of them. I have to say as a uh, veteran of the industry and a, a avid consumer of Maryland beer, the other prospect behind this that makes me excited is that the focus on quality has continued to be maintained. Um, we'll see chunks almost of of time where quality makes leaps and bounds um and that's that's a great thing for a growing industry because it means that people aren't becoming um sedate with the idea of we're just going to sit here and, and allow what we're doing to be the best that it can be we are going to find the best that we can be and pursue that yeah absolutely and and I don't think of, you know, it's funny customers come into the tasting room um, or if you're out at festivals or we do farmer's markets or whatever. And they're like, oh, I was at your 
competitor and it could be any brewery. It could be, you know, like I was at your competitor Guinness and I'm like, well, I don't know if I would consider Guinness and Milkhouse to be a uh, head to head as far as the, not even the same kind of business model. But um, what I have found to be probably the coolest thing of, about the industry in our state is that we are so collaborative and so there for each other and we're all friends. And um, it's not about like, I'm going to do it better than you. It's like, oh, well, these people are making excellent beer and that makes me need to step up my game. Like you were saying, that's such a great thing for a growing industry. Um, yeah, it's the, the quality of beer that is coming out of our state is unbelievable. Leaps and bounds, as you know, as a veteran of the industry, but even five years ago, the quality of beer, I mean, it's just, it's insane. It's pretty awesome. It's very encouraging. And I think that that's something that uh, all of us in the community and everybody supporting the community of Maryland's beer uh, can, can get behind, you know, there's nothing like even the friendly digs between brewers that you hear every once in a while, you know, like if you ever sit around in some of these, uh, in some of these tasting sessions with folks who are truly assessing beer together, uh, you, you might catch a brewer throwing a little bit of shade at a friend of his at another brewery. Like, Hey, did you mean to have that flaw in your beer? Oh yeah. But it's that kind of stuff that keeps you on your toes and you know, you, you always want to do better next time. Rising tides raise all ships. So we've definitely, we're continuing to see huge improvements. And it's also cool that you can go to someone and be like, Hey, friends at other breweries that make beer totally different than me, drink beer totally different than me, taste this, tell me, like, let me know what you think. Um, so that's a, we have a great arsenal of people to be able to bounce ideas off of. So I think that's a, another huge benefit of the tight knit group of our industry. So I believe that you have three more beers. This will put a smack in the middle of them. What is your third beer? Is this the one that's going to make Todd a happy camper? I think so. Stairway for Todd. So, um, as I mentioned before, we, um, our deal is, whew, frothy. Um, our deal is traditional beers. We make one IPA and one pale ale. Very, I would say more and more breweries now, but few breweries have such a limited hoppy um, portfolio. So Stairway is an old school English style IPA, 7.2%, uh, about 60 IBUs. Um, it is big malt backbone, nice bitterness. Um, I would say the perceived IBUs are much lower given how big the, uh, the malty backbone is to this. Um, yeah, I actually don't drink Stairway very often. 7% is, um, far outside of my daily, my daily drinking. So, um, but I do, I do love it. There was a time that when we started switching to, um, local grains uh, a couple of years ago, and when we switched even just the base malt in this, um, several batches, we just could not put our finger on like, there's something about this that I don't like. And so we constantly have been tinkering and tinkering with this recipe. Um, and I think we, We've got it to where I believe everybody on the staff likes it, which, as you know, gets to be difficult. You know, not everybody is going to like every beer that you make, right? Um, but yeah, so we actually, that's another kind of fun thing that we do um, that I think may be a little different for some breweries is um, because we're so dependent on our local suppliers, our recipes will... Um, they may change brew to brew just based on what's available. Um, with little to no perception, probably from the public. Um, but you know, when we're tasting these beers every day at every stage, um, we can certainly, and obviously the fellow brewers watching can attest, not that I'm a brewer, but you know what I mean? Um, can attest that you, you do tell the difference in house, but it's, it's kind of cool to continue to play around and, and try to make the best beer that we can with what we have. So stairway for Todd as I just sloshed it on my desk. <laughs> I like that you mentioned batch to batch variation. I was uh, talking yesterday with Scott Sanders of Tobacco Barn Distillery in uh, Hollywood, mm -hmm. Maryland. And he was talking about 
how important that variation is to their business model because they want to be able to release batch whiskey and mm -hmm. have it mean something every time you right. purchase the new batch or a new batch. And uh, you're you're dead on these these beers. No matter how you hone them in and on the scale for most of Maryland's breweries, uh, there will be variation that will be noticeable because you don't have you know. 2,000 barrel fermenters of the same recipe that you can blend together to come up with right. the perfectly consistent beer. Right. Um, and I have to say that having drunk Stairway for several years, I believe that it has fallen into a very nice stride and is a wonderfully delicious uh, right. pale ale. Yeah, I, um, we also tend to err on the side. All of our beer is quite dry. Um, we all just... Over time, even when I first started, um, when Abby was with the brewery, um, with our first brewer, Thomas, our last brewer, Brad, our brewer, Harry, now, we all, it's kind of, it's so funny that we all have just ended up with kind of the same taste in beer. I don't know if it's just like, you know, don't they say you start like looking like your spouse or looking like your pet the longer they're around or something? I don't know. We all like the same stuff. So um, it's, it's been cool to watch the evolution, even from a customer standpoint. I was a customer before I ever even worked in the alcohol industry. Um, and I just think of like leaps and bounds of how far our quality um, has come. And I think that a huge part of that has been um, really being able to hone in using those local ingredients. Um, so it's, it's cool. Cool industry to work in, wouldn't you agree? I love it. Not much better. I mean, what's better? Awesome people with interesting business models, great tasting products, and it happens to have the fringe benefit of also being alcohol. Yeah, it's not like alcohol is kind of, it's not the least cool part, but it's cool that there's so many other amazing parts of our industry that like, it's like beers, like uh, it's on the side, like the relationships that you build with people in this industry. I just feel like you don't see that. You don't see the camaraderie and the companionship that, that we have amongst each other in many other industries. It's, it's very cool. We might be very surprised. We could go to Silicon Valley and the guys from Google and Apple could be like best buddies all, you know, hanging out and do, doing what, brewery reps do that's, that's a funny thing to think about is that i haven't watched that show silicon valley is that what it's like uh it's it's much more debauched than the brewing industry ah, then i'll just stick to the brewing industry i think oh, yeah, yeah. Right. we got some love from abby in the comments oh hi abby uh, I don't see any questions about any of the beers, but Todd does definitely believe that the stairway is so darn good because of the water. Oh, yeah, that is another, um, yeah, that is another huge factor. So we are on a well, obviously. Um, we do very little to modify our water. Um, actually, the only beers that we do modify slightly the pH um, are our hoppier beers because we found that um, we do not get good hop utilization. Uh, which was, I think, the nail in the coffin for Smash, because um, it was great for a week, and then it was just like, ugh, you know. So we've definitely played around with different modifications, but for our traditional, like our farmhouse, um, our lager, our hef, um, any of our barreled stuff, our wild beer, we don't do any kind of water mods. It's just we do have really wonderful water which you don't realize until you're used to drinking like filtered city water and then you have really good well water. It's like, how was I drinking this nasty bleach tasting water my whole life? <laughs> <You know? laughs> they call that swill. Swill. Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> Bringing like jugs of farm water home to drink. <laughs> So uh, what's what's next on the on the tasting list? Let's see if we can get some uh, some more comments out of our viewers. All right. So next um, is Coppermine Creek. So this is a 
dry Irish stout. Um, this and our porter, which is a fall winter seasonal, um, are the two oldest recipes that we've brewed. I, I'm pretty sure we've made little to no modifications of this recipe ever. Um, so it is four and a half percent dry, has notes of dark chocolate and coffee, um, but it's, I would say light to medium body. And surprisingly, this beer sells unbelievably well in the summer. Like people, I don't know, you know, people drink what they drink, right? And stout drinkers drink it year round, but this is not super heavy. Um, we do serve it on nitro at the brewery. I have it at nitro and CO2, obviously for crawler fills, but um, yeah, I do like this. I like a little half and half with this. I like it just straight up. It's very comforting. Um, but again, four and a half percent. So it's very sessionable, super easy. And it pairs very well with pizza. If you're, you know, if you're a pizza fan, which I don't know many people who are not fans of pizza. You made the right decision not doing this from the tasting room because there are several people in the comments right now who are saying that this is their favorite beer. And I think that they would be banging down the doors together <laughs> at this moment. And I think Suzanne is having a little bit of an identity crisis because I think this may be her third this is my favorite beer comment about your beers. So she either loves everything or she really can't figure out which one is her favorite because she loves them all so much. Oh, Suzanne. She has been a huge supporter of us from the very beginning. She actually even has done uh, farmer's markets with us. Um, so she's definitely, definitely the ultimate Milk House fan. We even have a hashtag for our Instagram, hi Suzanne, when we share her posts. <laughs> Hi, Suzanne. Yeah, and yeah, she, <laughs> she acknowledges that she is guilty of loving them all. So that's wonderful for us. Uh, I also want to say hi to Brian Butler. I think that that's our man from the uh, yeah, extension. From the and uh, great to see him in here. And uh, Brian Pham was just talking a little bit about water chemistry. I think that we may have triggered some thoughts there. He said that it's fascinating stuff when you start to look at it and uh, play around yeah. with it. So, absolutely. I'm glad that we uh, I'm glad that we had that introduction, Todd. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, I, I don't know why I didn't think of that. <sighs> See, yeah, it's all over the place right now. You talked all about lambs. You didn't talk about the well. Did not talk about the well. That's true. So uh, I think you brought up a very good point there about stouts and porters in the summer. I am guilty of being a stout and porter fan year round, and yeah. nobody can convince me that there is an appropriate season for stouts. I hear you. So I, I do feel that I'm a very seasonal drinker, um, but I will drink lighter beers and lighter as far as ABV beers year round. Um, I always like something with a little bit of hop. I always like something that is dry. I just, I don't know. I'm not a sweets person. I like, give me a bag of potato chips over a pan of brownies any day. I just prefer dry um and savory i guess but we see huge huge stout sales we have a couple of accounts who have stout year round um does really well for them on draft um for our porter though um like i mentioned it's a our fall winter seasonal so it's actually a shade darker malt than the stout um it's black patent versus chocolate um it's a little bit higher abv uh, I would say much more robust than it's American robust porter. So it definitely has a little bit more oomph to it. Um, and we found even with our wide variety of draft lines that um, dark beers always cannibalize each other at the brewery. I don't know. I don't know. So we, the porter will do really well um, when it first comes out. And then they, that and the stout just kind of seem like they're always always kind of playing for the top dark beer. So we did an Imperial Stout one year and the three of them just, although three completely different beers just totally cannibalized each other. So I don't, I don't know what that is um, for us, but I mean, I, I will, I'm guilty of getting me a stout or two in the summer. I do, I do like to get a six pack of pearl necklace every now and then, even in the hot months, it's delicious. Or the Reveille Coffee Stout from Wardaka. Actually, I have a crawler of that that I've squirreled away. But I just yeah, had, uh, I think it was Nose to the Grind from Idiom. 
Oh yeah, I haven't Cabinets. had that. Okay. And I'm I'm a big coffee stout guy. Uh, yeah. Uh, hashtag affiliated when I was working at Monocacy Brewing Company Brutus was like hands down I thought Brutus was probably the best stout in the state so and, good uh, I have to say that that coffee stout that Idiom just put out was pretty darn tasty too so it's still stout that. weather out there people get out and support your local stouts absolutely there's a ton of good oh you know what other one I really like too is um, I don't know if they do it year round is Keeper Stout over at Checker Spot Steve Marsh and Judy it's oh fabulous. man, that beer is. <sighs> There's so many good beers. I'm so sad that I can't go to all my favorite breweries. And since we're chatting about uh, Baltimore Brewery, there, the writer of Beer in Baltimore, Maureen O'Pre, is in the comments. Oh, hi, Maureen. Always lovely to see Maureen around, and she's also a fan of savory. I do have to say, I'm a savory fan myself, but I think the idea of blending savory and sweet, like chocolate on savory stuff chocolate covered mm -hmm. pretzels is a really delicious thing and yes. i'm also a fan of the chocolate covered pretzel meme from mall rats so i have not seen this you're gonna have to send it to me go go watch the movie mall rats by kevin smith and you'll you'll enjoy a whole litany of chocolate covered pretzel jokes perfect my i uh have been eating a lot of salted dark chocolate lately because i like the the salty the savory and the sweet and it also has the almonds. I like a nice little crunch. I should have brought that up here. That would have been really good with the stout, but I left it downstairs. Amateur move. Bad planning, bad planning. Yeah, right? Bad planning, for sure. All right. Uh, let's round out with the last beer, and then let's just kind of shoot the breeze a little bit about what's going on in Maryland. And let's do it. We'll have you give like a real positive outlook and make everybody so happy. <sighs> That's why wait. you're here. Absolutely. So this is kind of, um, this is kind of not fair that I decided to bring this out for this because it is no longer available. This is one of the last few bottles that we had in the cellar. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about our um, wild yeast program at the farm. So this has a very official label from the cellar of barrel number six. This was bottled January of last year. So um, I sent over the description for you and I actually didn't even taste this before now. So let's hope that it aged as well as the last bottle I had did. Um, so actually before I started at the brewery um, about, sorry, <laughs> um, Tom and our old brewer, Thomas and Brad, we must be getting a delivery of something. Sorry, my dogs are going wild. Um, went around the farm and collected some wild yeast samples um, from all different kinds of stuff. And by collected yeast samples, I mean they had like a cup of wort and they scraped tree bark or whatever into that um, and captured the yeast. And we built up these little tiny, from tiny flasks up to five gallon pitches. Um, so this was the very first of those barrels. You can see it's crystal clear, which we were super, super happy about. Um, I'm going to have to pull up my notes because it has been so long since I have had this beer that I don't want to say the wrong thing. Uh, so this is totally fermented 100% um, with yeast that we harvested from the farm, um, which is really cool. So it is a turbid mash. Um, it has a little bit of smoked wheat in it. So it has, it had, like I said, I haven't tasted it yet. It had um, a little bit of smoke, like a light citrus flavor, um, some notes of like pineapple and just some barrel funk. So like I said, we, the Tom and the boys collected these yeast pitches. Um, and then basically we would go down to the milking parlor, which is down on the farm where we kept all of these barrels separate from this was long ago when we still kept all these separate from our other beer. Um, and we would go taste these pitches and they ranged anywhere from completely horrifying band-aid, baby diaper, just acetone, terrible to like bright stone fruit, light tartness. Um, they definitely went through a lot of changes um, and we ended up finding a couple that we really love. So native barrel six um, is fermented totally with an elm culture. 
um, from one of the sides of an elm tree on the farm and um, sat in the barrel for a long time. It was obviously a very slow ferment with that pitch. Um, and it turned out to be something that we were really amazed. Like we love using local ingredients. Uh, we love showcasing the terroir of Maryland in our beer, but this was, this was kind of like the next level of that. So um, yeah, Native Barrel 6, one of the last bottles. You can give it a little taste. And just to clarify, there was a question. It was not turban mash, like something that one would wear on their head. Turbid. It is turbid mash. as in a turbid uh, mash. is a high starch mash, basically. Oh, it is delicious. Oh my gosh, this is so good. So we do have, um, if you've been to the brewery before, um, for those of you watching, um, we do have quite a few barrels in the brewery and then we do have some actually down on the farm. Um, some have different yeast cultures that we've cultivated from the farm over the years. Some are a blend of our yeast and purchased bugs um, from Jasper. Um, some are totally purchased. Um, some are a mix of clean and wild. Um, so we have a, a bunch of different, um, bunch of different stuff going. And we also have several um, wine barrels that we turned into upright fruit fooder fermenters. Um, so we've actually cultured um, a couple fruits that we really like. So we have one from peaches that we got several years ago that we still really like. Um, apricots, strawberries, plums, red and yellow. Um, so yeah, that's been something that we've been working on behind the scenes for a really long time. Um, and it's been very cool. Just the, the few that have been ready that we've been able to release, the response we've gotten from them has been really cool. So yeah, definitely all the way from light lager, lawn mowing beer to wild, funky, smoky, sour, fruited, weird. We've got a little bit of everything. So I'm really actually happy with how this aged. I, I had no idea what I was going to get myself into, but it's delicious. I might have to come up with some essential business to find my way over at uh, Milk House in the next okay. few days. We are an essential business, Jim, so... Aye, aye. All right, so uh, we are coming up on a couple weeks from when most of our favorite day of the year, Maryland Craft Beer Festival, would be uh, happening. Uh, unfortunately, yes. that is not happening uh, any longer due to the restrictions that have been placed on large gatherings. And it's a very unfortunate thing that we had to cancel that event. I do think that uh, on behalf of the Brewers Association of Maryland and all of our members, we made the right decision by not trying to Absolutely. risk anybody's health. Uh, at this point, it doesn't sound like we would have been able to do it no matter what. But yeah. uh, what are your thoughts on large scale events in the future? How do you, do you have any thoughts on what this kind of uh, time may have done to people's appetite for large events? What are your thoughts? Oh gosh, that's so hard to say. Um, I think that um, on the surface, it's really easy to have a conversation about economic injury and economic damage that's happened um, in the wake of COVID-19. Um, but I think it's, I think it's going to take us a while to see what the psychological damage is going to look like, not only for um, from our staff's perspective, from a work perspective, what does safety look like moving forward just in our day-to-day -day lives, but also um, with those large groups. Um, so I, I can't say with any certainty actually what I imagine that will look like going forward. Um, we also um, have come to terms with, um, this would have been our 10th brew fest on the farm. Um, that that is probably not going to be happening this year, or it may be postponed or certainly will not look how it has in years past. Um, Jim, I know you've been in um, certainly a small space with a lot of people. Um, but I think, I think that Maryland breweries have shown up in an incredible way. I think that our legislators have shown up for us um, in several amazing ways by giving us some allowances for being able to deliver beer, for 
um, you know, all of these different options um, with delaying the tax uh, filings and payments. Um, so I think all of us owe them a great deal for that. Um, but unfortunately, it's, it's just kind of unknown. You know what I mean? I, I wish that I could say that, oh, you know, we'll, we'll start this thing back up and flip a switch and everybody will be ready to be out together and do things as we did before. Um, I think that we'll all just have to kind of get used to a new normal and we'll just have to figure out what that looks like. But um, the support that people have shown for Maryland Craft Beer has been unbelievable. And I think that they're all gonna be ready when they can come out of their houses and come back and support us. Um, whether that means they wanna hang out and drink beer or just have one beer and take beer home just to be cautious. Um, but I think all of us owe a huge gratitude to our customers uh, because without them, you know, we wouldn't be doing any of this. So thank you to all of the Maryland beer lovers out there for continuing to, to support local. Um, and I feel comfortable speaking on behalf of everyone that I do not think that they will forget this anytime soon. So thank you guys. I think you are the most appropriate person to speak on behalf of the industry. You've been uh, selected as the leader of the organization and uh, the person who should be making that that kind of prognosis. So thank you for that. For those of you that are watching, we are really having a great time doing these virtual happy hours with our members. It's great seeing you come in and uh, offer your comments, your feedback, your questions. Um, I'm going to address one more question that's in the comments right now from a friend of ours, Kerry Keem. He would like to know if there are any planned milk house barrel releases coming up. So actually right before um, the world tried to end on us, um, we were going through and tasting um, some different barrels. We try to do that very periodically. Um, and we did find a few that we felt were pretty close to being ready. Um, now, ready, what that means is um, we had a couple that we want to look at doing some different blends, um, and we definitely have some fruit wine that we've been working on that is ready. So for those of you who don't know, um, whether it's in our clean beer or our barreled beer or our wild beer, um, we only purchase whole fruit from local farms. Um, if it's stone fruit, for example, we hand pit everything ourselves. Um, we smash it into a wine barrel and let it ferment for six to nine months. Um, so it's kind of cool. Our fruit is basically a year ahead of schedule. So the fruit that we will be releasing this year, we actually bought and processed last year. So no purees, no syrups, none of that stuff. Um, we have a fruit press in house actually that our brewer built. He's a, in addition to being a wonderful brewer, he's an extremely talented woodworker. Um, so he actually built our fruit press, which is very cool. Um, so long story is super long. Yes, we do have some stuff um, that is ready. Um, so once we get kind of back in the swing of things, that's definitely on the top of our priority list to get those out and available to you guys. Um, hopefully, we've actually talked about maybe bottling some of those. Um, we haven't bottled beer in a very long time, but um, that's definitely on the radar as well. So just... Uh, just keep your eyes peeled on our socials. Hopefully we will have some delicious wild goodness ready for you soon. And speaking of keeping your eyes peeled on socials, keep your eyes open for some announcements from the Brewers Association of Maryland. We have some interesting things happening. Uh, despite not being able to have a an in-person event this year, we are in the process of putting together what we hope to be a great virtual event for everybody to attend and show their support for Maryland breweries. We will also be opening uh, in the next couple coming days um, a virtual tip jar to help as a fundraiser and a support for the association. Uh, the Brewers Association of Maryland takes on advocacy on behalf of the state's more than 100 breweries. We work hard to ensure that there are legislative advancements for the industry, work hard to ensure that the industry is promoted well, and that our members have access to things that they need both in terms of education and in terms of influence in the marketplace. Um, and without the fundraising efforts of the events that we put on, um, we are going to be reaching out to you, our supporters and fans, and asking for 
whatever help you may be able to offer to uh, allow us to continue our work for Maryland's breweries. Um, Sarah, thank you very much for being on today. Everybody, please go and give Milk House Brewery at Still Point Farm a follow. They've been commented on in all of the comments in here. You'll notice you have some other rival fans to deal with when they open back up. So start making friends with the people who have already been there. And uh, if you haven't looked yet, go to MarylandBeer.org. We have some updates there about uh, some information about retail opportunities for Maryland Beer. You can see who has curbside pickup available, who's doing delivery. We gave them a big shout out earlier. Check out Beer Me for delivery of Maryland Beer to your home. And uh, keep showing your support. Our breweries are doing this for you. They love their communities. They love the people that come into their doors and they'd like to be able to see you on the other side of this. So yes. happy Friday, have a safe and healthy weekend, and we will see you all very, very soon. Goodbye. Bye. Great work. <laughs>